Hello there, and a very warm welcome to Season 2, Episode 1 of People Soup. It's Ross McIntosh here. So, we've had our summer break, which included a trip to Montreal for the Association for Contextual Behavioural Science World Conference. I was presenting some research as part of a symposium around our work at City University of London with Dr Paul Flaxman, and I'll be telling you more about that as this season progresses. Now, there were not many there at the conference from the UK, and a lot of people asked me to pass on their love and regards to our first guest this season, Dr Nick Hooper. Nick, welcome. Hey Ross, how you doing? I'm all right, thanks man. Um, boy, were you missed at that conference. Yeah, do you know why? Well, no, why? It's because at the conference, I'm usually at the center of social activities, including drinking. And so I think other people use me as an excuse to party. So that, that's probably why people miss me so much. So, so you're like a, like a party catalyst. Essentially, I have no substantial psychological content or knowledge, <laughs> but what I do is I provoke social activities. <laughs> I dispute what you've just said, but, but one thing you were particularly missed on was um, on the last night of the conference for our listeners, there's something called the Follies, which are pretty legendary in the ACBS circle. And this is where basically people get up and do a turn. Now, I didn't take part this year. I did have a moment before the conference where I tried to persuade Paul Flaxman to do a joint double act with me. But to be honest, there were some artistic differences, so we decided to park <laughs> it for, for this year. But I think I did represent our UK and ROI chapter pretty reasonably on the dance floor with some kind of quite sophisticated or, or courageous moves. So I, I think I possibly did you proud on that on the dancing front. You know, I would have liked to have seen that. I would have liked to have seen, one, the conversation between you and Paul about what <laughs> your sketch was going to be, and oh. two, you dancing by yourself representing the UK and Republic of Ireland chapter. That yeah. would have been something to see. I think I particularly nailed it for Madonna Like a Prayer. I, I'm, I've, I've no doubt. I've no doubt you were an improvement on my two-step, which yeah, is well. the only dance move that I have. Well, hopefully we'll find out um, next year in Dublin at the conference. Yes, I'll, I'll be there. I'll be there. If, if not before. Mm -hmm. If there's any dancing opportunities, to be honest, I'm there. Well, I mean, I dance with my, with my, two, with my three, three now, with my uh, three-year-old son every day. So you are welcome to Bristol to my house to do some dancing. Excellent, excellent. I'll, I'll, I might take you up on that, actually, if I'm in Bristol. I might just go <laughs> around for some shapes. Yeah, um, that, that'll be a strange conversation with my wife. Yeah. <laughs> yes. This yeah. man has come to dance with us. <laughs> yes, yes. Right, right. Well, my research notes, Nick, on you say lecturer, author, actor legend, and Welsh hunk of man. Um, that's the extent of my research and, and knowing you. Well, yeah, I mean, that that's some pretty some pretty heavy research you've done into me there. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, I am no longer a Welsh hunk of man. I am a Welsh dad, which means that I have a, a dad bod now rather than any ounce of hunkiness left. Um, I am not, don't think I'm an act legend. don't even know if those exist. But um, I've been in, in and around this game now for 13 years. Um, I... I guess I'm an author uh, because I've, I've written a book um, and I like to write. And so, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll go for author. And um, the thing that pays my bills um, is working in a university where I, where I lecture. And so, yeah, I mean, that's – I think you've got it. I think in a yeah. nutshell, you, you've summed me up. Cool. Uh, and when you say, I guess I'm an author, hell, man, you've got a book on a shelf, so you're an author. Yeah, I, gu I guess so. It feels <laughs> – yeah. Um, not that I want to get into it too much now, but that book was sort of um, a, a, a where I was taking other people's research and writing about it. There wasn't any sort of it. It, it wasn't a, these are my thoughts and sort of this is my life and this is my philosophy of living. There was nothing sort of novel that I was sending out there into the world. But um, hopefully that will that will come one day. Yeah. Well. Well. If people want more of that, they can go to your blog. I would say. Yeah, that's more like it. 
that's more like it. So, I mean, we can get into it later on, but I'm trying to write something something uh, more personal that's in the tone of, of the blog that I hope to turn into a book one day. So, Excellent. yeah, an, an author. If I wake up in the morning and I, and I think I'm an author, then yeah, sure, I'm an author. Before we go on, I'm just going to do a bit of news and a couple of reviews because because we've had a summer break. I just want to catch up with the listeners. We've had some great support over the summer. People really like the insights from Shannon Haran, where she drew on research to reveal the science of vacations. We had a, a review on iTunes from Nathan E, who said, So I listened to, to Cave Dweller last night. So glad to discover my mind is normal because, boy, do I get a lot of those thoughts. And Nathan went on to say that he'd given his mind the name Annoying Nathan. And I think this is great stuff. Firstly, to realise that having these thoughts is normal and part of the experience of being human. Secondly, by giving our mind a playful nickname, it can help us to recognise those thoughts arising and perhaps also recognise them for what they are, or even just take them a little bit less seriously. We also had a shout-out from Jim Lucas, fellow podcaster, who said on Twitter... Hey, Ross McCoach, just had me a double dose of people soup on the bus travelling in, enjoying your entertaining interview style. And that is praise indeed from Jim, who's got, as I say, he's got his own podcast. And you can take a listen. It's called Self Help Satnav. I'm a fan. It's both informative and a very useful source of information. And I'll put a link in the show notes for this episode. Now, just briefly on to future guests, because I'm quite excited about this. I'm in the process of coordinating a range of people, including Dr. Mike Sinclair, act therapist, another author, and clinical director of the City Psychology Group. Nikki Hemmings, who's lead psychologist at Soma Analytics. Jason Tucker, a therapist in Nova Scotia. He uses ACT and is also interested in how to make it as accessible as possible to different populations. We've got Johnny Line, who is an exciting new voice in the field of organisational psychology. He positively buzzes with ideas based on research, theory and his own experience. And then we've got Raphael Dubois, who is a mental performance coach for the Toronto Blue Jays baseball team. So that's just a little sample of some of the, the future guests coming up. And now I'll return to Nick, who's been patiently waiting. Thank you, Nick. I'm no still, worries. You're still there. I'm still here. Excellent. We're such wizards with this, this technology, man. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? Not so much. <laughs> that, that, that two Egypts could be sitting here. And I think, I'm pretty sure we are recording. So, um, oh dear. We'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll see. You're going to email me in about, you know, an hour and say, <laughs> we've got nothing. We're going to have to do it again. Yeah. I've just got, <laughs> just got a low hum. <laughs> so, Right, so so let's get down to business next. I just wanted to start just by asking you a quite a broad question about your your journey into ACT. Kind of what first attracted you or got you hooked on on ACT? Yeah, um, so I did uh, an undergraduate psychology degree at Swansea University and um, I didn't really like it. Uh, and, and this sort of resulted in me not really being uh, the best student, so I tended not really to go to lectures and just got by uh, by doing the bare minimum. So And so I wasn't exactly the academic type, if you like. But then when it came to the third year of my degree, I wanted to do one less module and so I decided to write a dissertation. And so I went to a secretary in the office and said, I think that people don't really talk about their problems enough or they try their best not to think about their problems and I'm not sure that's a good way to deal with to deal with problems and she said oh there's a new lecturer that might be interested in supervising you why don't you go and speak to her and so I knocked on the door of uh, Dr. Louise McHugh's office and um, and we started a conversation uh, that started with the paradoxical uh, effects of thought suppression and ended with acceptance and commitment therapy and so I, uh, I wrote a dissertation about ACT, and that was the point at which I sort of fell in love with it. And, mm. um, and that's how sort of ACT came about. And um, it, it basically, I don't want to be too extreme, but it changed the course of my life. Wow. Um, I, and I can go on if you like, just because it, um, 
it gave me a new way to relate to my own thoughts and feelings. And, and specifically diffusion was powerful for me because every time my mind came along and said, you're not smart enough to do this. You're not good enough to do this. You're going to fail. For mm. the first time in my life, I was able to spot it and able to, to, to move ahead with things that were important to me, regardless of how much my mind was trying to protect me. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that's how, I, how I got the bug, if you like. Mm. Back, I was 21 years old writing, writing a dissertation. Um, and after that, Louise asked me to do a PhD. I, uh, I said yes. I had absolutely nothing else planned. And so I thought, well, you know, why right. not? I had no idea really what a PhD involved. Uh, turned up and did a PhD on thought suppression and um, an act as a way to manage unwanted thoughts and feelings. And so that's the story, Ross. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that and being so open. I think what, what intrigues me is when you're talking about that diffusion piece. Would you mind just explaining to the listeners a bit more about diffusion and how it might show up at work, perhaps? Yeah, sure. For me, and, and I guess for a lot of people, uh, diffusion is essentially taking our thoughts a little bit less seriously. But for me, there's more to diffusion about that. It's about sort of like undermining truth or, un, or like trying to replace truth with helpfulness. So that will be like psychological, psychological jargon to a lot of people listening. So I'll, so I'll give you an example. Yeah, please. Imagine, imagine that you, and I'll try and give a work example. Um, imagine that you are late for a meeting. Mm -hmm. And imagine that you are just about to go into the meeting and there's 10 people in this meeting and your mind says to you, when you walk in, everyone is going to turn around and there's going to be a couple of chuckles and it's going to be really embarrassing. That's what your mind says to you just before you get to the meeting. Mm -hmm. Now, like if, if we take that thought too seriously, we might turn around, go back to our desks and type an email saying, really sorry, got caught in traffic. Or we could have actually made the meeting. Now, the thing about that thought is people might turn around and people will chuckle and you'll feel really embarrassed. The thing about that thought is it could be true. It could be a true thought. You could walk in through that door. You probably will feel embarrassed. People might turn around and people might ch chuckle. Mm. That, that, is, that is something that might be true. But the important question is, is the thought helpful? Is the thought helpful in, in moving you towards something that's important to you? Forget about the truthfulness of thoughts. Is the thought helpful? If that thought prompts you to go back to your desk and send that email, it, acting on it hasn't been helpful. It hasn't been a helpful mm. thing to do. And so instead of looking at thoughts now in terms of how true they are, I ask myself, how helpful is this thought in getting me to where I want to go? It's interesting you bring this up because that's something I find really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. Because I, I use that, is it helpful? Yeah. A lot in, not just in my working life, but in, in my whole life. I think it's so much more effective than that, is it true? Because like yes. you say... It could be true that 10 people will turn around and smirk or laugh or just give me a raised eyebrow. Now, Nick, I just want to change tack slightly um, because we were chatting before we started recording and discovered, well, I kind of knew, but I think I'd forgotten that we've both been working on the same research project, not, not directly with each other, but it, it's the research project working with teachers using ACT interventions with teachers. And I know that um, a personal project of yours has emerged from that, that work. And it's the, the values-based diary. And I just want to talk a bit about that, understand how it came about. Um, well, yeah, that's the first question, I guess. How did it come about, this, this diary? So with, um, with, a, with a lovely colleague in Bristol, uh, Dr. Duncan Gillard, we started delivering what was essentially act-based stress management interventions for teachers. Uh, and this was based on uh, Paul Flaxman's 2 plus, 2 plus 1 model. Now, as part of that 2 plus 1 model, you're required to sort of... To, well, actually, I can give you the pitch of the 2 plus 1 model. Yeah, we go can, for it. 
we can use mindfulness to help us move towards the things that are important to us or our values. That's essentially like the model summed up, if you like. Mm. And so as, as part of the intervention, teachers spend a lot of time clarifying their values, like who do they want to be in the world? What sort of qualities do they want to bring to their daily interactions with people, for example? Um, and so the typical values clarification exercise would involve having sort of 60 values, things like kindness and compassion, and honesty and persistence and other such words like that, and narrowing those down until you're left with three values. Mm-hmm. And those values are, are, are meant to encompass who you want to be in the world. So they're pretty important things, you know, like who do I want to be? So like my values, for example, might be uh, teaching others or striving to be a better person, or having uh, relationships involving love and affection. So only three values is what you'd have at the end of this exercise. Mm. And, um, and people loved it. People loved it. Loved the idea of like values being a guide to how you act in this in this life of ours. And I remember um, this one teacher that we had that did the values exercise. They were very enthusiastic about it. And we said at the end of the session, right, bring. Uh, those values back to next week's session when we do a bit more work on them. And so the teacher came back the uh, the following week, and I said to everyone, right, get get the cards out with your values on. And this teacher said that they'd forgotten the um, the piece of paper. I said that's okay, just just write down the values that you uh, that you highlighted last week. And they said, I've forgotten them. I said, what? You've forgotten them? It was only a week ago. And I was shocked that like someone could forget something so important to them with, within only a week. Um, but it turns out that that, that that experience wasn't only something reported by that one teacher, but was reported by lots of – or has been reported by lots of people since. Hmm. Uh, specifically, this is really easy to lose contact with your values. It's really hmm. easy to lose contact with who you want to be in the world. And so – I started having thoughts around the time that we were doing this teacher training, which is, okay, how do we remind people of their values? Mm-hmm. And, so we, and so I know that Paul and various other people have things like fridge magnets or like, you know, those little rubber bands that go r- around people's yeah, wrists and yeah. stuff. Just, just as a reminder of like, oh, this is who you want to be in the world. And it was at that time I thought, well, what better environmental cue than a diary? Mm. Not, not a journal. A journal is where sort of like there are no dates in it, but you could probably clarify your values in it. The problem I had with journals was that they often are in the garage within like two weeks of starting them. Yeah. It's really difficult to, to keep up with the journal. And so I wanted a diary who's to, to create a diary, an annual diary whose primary focus is to just write your meetings in it and, you know, like record the things that you need to record to in it and sort of what put what I call a sprinkling of act and values into the diary. So nothing sort of hardcore, nothing that's going to require a lot from people. They literally just have to do a values clarification exercise at the beginning of the year and use some of the things that they highlight as their values as as guides for how to act across each week. Mm. And so that's how it sort of that's sort of how it's all came about. It, I've never heard this story before, so it's great because you, you're now in your your second year, aren't you? Yeah. So we. Um, began it last year and had absolutely no idea what we were doing yeah because the thing is you can have a a good idea but like how to turn that into something is is tricky especially when you know nothing about printing or like like where do you get diaries printed how do you create a front cover how do you put the front cover in a format that the printers are going to know how to work with how do you advertise something like this I've literally no nouse when it comes to marketing. So my entire marketing strategy is Twitter and Facebook. Like, how do you get this thing out there? Then how do you sell it? How do you accept payment for it? How do you mm. tax, pay tax for it? So it was like a huge learning curve for us last year and, and a lot of work as well. And so um, we were touch and go about whether to do it again this year. But upon receiving good feedback from people, mm. uh, we decided to, to give it a go. And so we've actually doubled our inventory this year and um, and, and, and are trying to use all of our learning from last year to try and make this year a little bit a little bit more smooth. Yeah, uh, feels quite act consistent that bold move of doubling the order because it, it's it's knowing that it'll be really really useful. It is 
you know, I think that the thing about act is when you start getting it, it's not something that you deliver to other people from a place of psychological Zen. It's something that fills your blood. Mm. And so, especially with this diary project and with a few other projects that I'm involved with as well that take me outside of that comfort zone, I need those act skills to keep me going. Yeah. Because especially with this diary, there's the real chance of failure. There's the real chance of, of people not liking it and that, then me feeling sort of judged as, as a result of that. There's the real chance of failure with regards to finances. Like, mm. like we've paid for this ourselves. As in, my wife is going to come to me and say, you lost money on this. Now we can't go on holidays. Yeah. You know, so like th those conversations could happen as a result of me doing this. And so you can imagine my mind is very busy gi giving me reasons not to pursue this. Mm. Um, but it's important to me. It's important to me because I want to, I want to try and contribute to the world. I want to put something out there and I want it to positively impact people's lives. And I, and I think that by helping people live in a more value consistent way that I'll be sort of achieving that, which helps mm. me sleep well at yeah. night. And, it, and it's not just for teachers, is it? Because I, I remember when I was, I was in the midst of training quite a few teachers in schools in London and, and actually one in Bristol as well. Mm -hmm. And what I found interesting is, is that, yeah, they'd lost touch with their values. They kind of become burdened and weighed down with responsibility of targets, policies, management, and sometimes during those sessions, you just start to get a, a glimmer and a conversation of when they started to talk about why the hell they got into teaching in the first place. Yeah. And you could see people actually kind of starting to light up uh -huh. and they kind of remembered, blimey, this is why I got into teaching. And that, that's yeah. quite, that's quite um, a humbling moment to, to see someone just reconnect with that value. So I'm with you. Anything that can help. Uh, uh, anyone get in touch with those with those values what's important to them yeah. I think it's brilliant and, it, and like you say it's like that visual cue it's that reminder it's in your bag yeah I think that especially teachers but not just teachers no no like, you know we, we live in a we live in a world where money is becoming tighter and as a result people are being expected to do more for less mm. and so like to get bogged down by um, some of the bureaucracies and, and, and some of the systems within which people work is just a really easy thing to do but if you can get people to a place where you're thinking where they're thinking why did i do this in the first place mm. what was it about this particular occupation that drew me to it if you can get them to that place then it sort of it, it will it, it will tap them into a value and being tapped into that value will, will make it easier to put up with, if you like, some of the systemic problems in workplaces these days. Mm, yeah, and and I guess the other thing to say is it's not it's not just for work. I mean, I can I can put uh, say a family event or a big going to a wedding in October, maybe even thinking going to that wedding in October with my it's my Spanish niece getting married. W what values do I want to bring to that family event? Yeah, I get and I guess by. By putting it, writing it down in a diary, it'll prompt me to, to think about that and reflect. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, values don't happen in a bubble. Um, mm. they, they, you know, they, they, they interact across different domains of your life. And this uh, diary, I, you know, it was, I designed it with teachers in mind. But 95% of the people that have bought the diary and are using it are not teachers. Mm. Uh, they're just people um, because it turns out that people who work are also people. And, and, and having uh, a clear understanding of one's values will hopefully impact you in the workplace, but will also impact you, you know, it, it outside of the workplace, yeah. uh, in, other, in other domains of your life that are likely to, uh, to actually – influence you in the workplace if you like and, and let me just try and clarify that for a second mm. okay you know if you're in a relationship imagine it's your father for example mm. and imagine you're, you're not quite acting in the way that you'd like within that relationship with your father that will impact how you work the next day when you go to work you will be you will be weighed down by the fact that you weren't be acting in a value consistent way in your relationship with your father 
And so, that, like, those things don't happen in a bubble. Everything bounces into each other. And so clarifying values, yes, in the workplace, but outside mm. of the workplace too, should impact your well-being inside of the workplace and outside of the workplace. Mm. Oh, blimey. Couldn't agree more. And I think more and more organizations are realizing you can't just treat people as a resource that you that you just focus on them at work. You need to you need to be, have regard for that for the whole person at work. Absolutely. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Yeah. Okay. So, so where can people get their hands on a diary? Give us, give us the deets, man. The details. Okay. And these might change over the years because I'm not sure we're doing this in the the optimal way. So, I have a website. It's uh, valuedliving.org. Yeah. And on that website, you can find information about the diary, but also ways to to buy the diary. Essentially, right now there are two ways to buy the diary. Uh, the first way is you can just email me. So we've got an, an email account uh, specifically for the diary and, and, and send inquiries to us that way and then sort of make a, a transfer via PayPal. This tends to work in sort of countries outside the UK sometimes. Or we're selling the diary via Etsy. So Etsy is an Amazon right. type site right. where you can um, where you can sort of make the payment through uh, that intermediary company. Brilliant. And I'll put all the links on the the show notes for this episode so so if people want to head there they'll be able to find all the links so they can go straight straight there and have a look that would be great mate and get one for themselves and one for their family and one yeah. for their employees and <laughs> exactly one for man. i mean it's early christmas presents i guess <laughs> absolutely yeah it's a great getting, christmas present great getting, christmas present. getting someone a present there's not bloody socks or a bit of a shitty jumper but it's something that that has a good chance of being used and being bloody useful as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I like to think that. You can use it as a stocking filler. But there are other things in the diary as well, not just the, the space to write values, but we've put in some, uh, some sort of more inspirational quotes. We've got reflection pages in there as well, and we've got an, an essay at the end of every month that sort of illustrates some act principles, uh, if you like, and, and illustrates how our minds work and how we try to deal with unwanted thoughts and emotions and maybe some better metaphors for how to manage those uh, unwanted thoughts and feelings. Brilliant. I love it. And what sort of feedback did you get from from year one? Any, anything that sticks in your mind? Just generally positively. Nothing really that sticks in my mind. Uh, so we I'll get sort of tweets or feedback via Facebook and Etsy saying that it's helped people to live in a way that's uh, more consistent with their values and that they can sort of notice a difference in their well-being as a result. And um, I, I guess I don't really know anything about this world, Ross. Mm. And so in my mind, if people are getting on well with it, and if it continues to sell this year, then it must be doing something right. Because mm. at the moment, what I'm not getting is a lot of people saying, Nick, you need to stop doing this because it's got nothing in it. Yeah. And so I, I guess that's how I'd answer that question is until the point comes at which it stops selling or that someone comes to me and says, there's a major flaw in this and this is the flaw, mm. then then I, th I think it's doing what it needs to be doing. I think it's, I think, it, like I say, I think it's such a bold move. I think it's such a winner that, that you're doing this. And it's, for me, it shows, it shows generosity from you in finding different ways to share, to share this science in a way that I'm all about trying to make it accessible. And yeah. I think this is a whole new way to, to make it accessible. Well, I appreciate you saying that, Russ. Yeah, pleasure, man. Now, you mentioned earlier uh, an, another project you're, you're thinking about. Is, is that related to your blog or what's that about? Um, so in the, yeah, it, well, you know what life is like. You, you sort of, you, you bounce around and different things hit you at certain times. And sometimes those things that hit you, they interact. Hmm. Um, and so first of all, I, I like you have wanted to make act accessible for people and i speak the at language to my students uh, and try and use it try and sort of like give them skills to manage their thoughts and feelings and so i want to make it accessible and i want to contribute and i want to sort of connect with people etc and so act is like this thing that's important to me mm. and at the same time as that i'm developing my writing via blogs and i, and I quite like the process of writing and, and, and really trying to um, write in a, in a clear and accessible way and at the same time I um, I had a son uh, called Max 
who um, who when you have children, you, you sort of like everything everything changes after that. Yeah, I guess, and, I guess your, um, value, your values change. Yeah, they have. Actually, I mean, I did a values clarification exercise shortly after Max and something showed up that had never showed up before, which was keeping my family safe or something like yeah, that. Yeah, wow. And I was like, oh, right, that's never been there before. Before now, I could jump out of an airplane, no problem. But now I'm like, right, we need to be careful when we cross this road. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, things things definitely change. Uh, but I, 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 And so we've got those, going back uh, slightly, we've got those three things like this act thing, this author thing, and this dad thing. Mm. And um, and then, you know, tragedies happen um, every day. And I know that a tragedy could happen to me, mm. if you like. And this was, uh, this sort of came uh, to, the, to, to the surface, if you like, while watching The Lion King. And you know, there's that that moment in The Lion King where Mufasa dies, and I was like sat there watching it with my son, thinking I could die. Christ, like, oh, yeah. No. I know it's like one of those moments. Where I was like, "Don't cry, Nick. Don't cry. Don't cry." <laughs> um, but as a result of sort of like all those things bouncing together, I yeah. thought, "Okay, right. If I die tomorrow, these are some things that I want my son to know." And so I'm sort of in the process right now. This, by the way, nobody might ever read this. At the moment, this is just for me and Max. But I'm in the process of writing what's essentially a self-helpy type mm. book to my son with nine rules for living. And um, I'll give it to him on his 18th birthday. And so like maybe something will come of that with regards to publishing it or something. Maybe it won't. But like I'm enjoying the, the process of writing about acts in that format and for and for my son and it's relatively therapeutic because it's like semi-autobiographical yeah. so, and it's chronological as well so it sort of like weaves different events that have happened in my life over the last 33 years and ties those to certain psychological principles and so i'm, in, I'm enjoying doing that uh, at the moment uh, you know just as a another sort of uh, you know on so many occasions my mind to say why are you doing this for you know, he's not going to like this or people won't like this or this is going to be a lot of work. Have you really got time to do this right now? Mm. Uh, but I sort of act and uh, diffusion, a bit of willingness as well, sort of get me get me to the place where I actually start typing on my computer. Wow. Uh, and so we'll see. We'll see what comes of that. Mate, I, 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 I just want to say, I think that sounds really, really powerful. Particularly, I love it, the, the inception in The Lion King. That's, that's a winner for me. <laughs> if I was on Dragon's Den, I'd be in, man. Oh, well, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, sorry, you're going you're gonna to tell us about another, another well, project. We're doing, well, I'm, like, I'm doing a few other things, um, just trying to sort of like get our act out there. So at the moment, we're trying to create a, a well-being curriculum for primary schools. Mm. So it's an act-based uh, curriculum for primary schools using the DNAV model yeah. that Louise Hayes and Joe Chiroki came up with over in Australia. And so that's got the potential to, to have some impact, which I'm excited about. And um, we're actually doing some work with robots as well, uh, trying to use... Do what? Uh, uh, yeah, we're trying to use some uh, relation, some bit of relational frame theory, a, a theory of language that underpins mm. ACT to help robots take perspective. Uh, and so it's, it's exciting, exciting, exciting things, exciting and anxiety provoking <laughs> things, both the same, uh, that sort of like keep me going in addition yeah. to, uh, to sort of the more chory type parts of my existence. Yeah. I'll tell, I'll tell you what, we need to get you on for, a, for another episode. Because <laughs> I think <laughs> as, as these things, as these things develop and emerge, um, yeah, let's get you back on because I'm really interested to find out more. Now, I'd, lo I'd love that, you know, because I really appreciate you asking me on to do this, and um, and think this is a this is a great idea what you're doing here. Oh, thanks very much, man. So I normally try and finish on, I don't know how we can condense anything or just pull something out. Is there a key takeaway from from the things you've said that that people listening, people maybe more people in the workplace anything any top tip or recommendation you'd give them yeah sure um so in my my book to max the third chapter or the third rule mm. is uh kill yourself stories so a, a long time ago steve hayes the guy who came up with act he coined the fa the, the phrase kill yourself every day and i love it he, he didn't mean obviously kill yourself every day because mm. that would be impossible he, but he meant kill stories about who you are every day because it's likely they'll hold you back. And I think that this is 
probably the case for many people in the workplace. I think that the chance comes up to do a presentation or to go for a promotion or to go and have a meeting with someone that's higher up in the hierarchy than you. And I think that at that time, your mind will get busy with stories. It'll get busy with I'm not smart enough or I'm not good enough or I'm not good at public speaking or I'm not very good, you know, speaking up, speaking with people that are higher up the hierarchy or any number of, of verbal stories that we have mm. about ourselves. And it's likely that those stories will, um, will hold you back. And so become more aware of your stories and, uh, and kill them when they stop you from doing the things that are important to you. I, you know, I've never heard that. And that's quite, that feels for me, it makes me gulp. <laughs> it makes me think, I'd, as you said, that all my own stories flooded in, not just about work, but about me and relationships, um, me as a son, me as a, a husband, all that yeah. sort of stuff. But how, how do we how do we kill them? Is it is it just like realizing that they're stories? How, what, is, is there anything we can do? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, that the thing that we talked about earlier on diffusion will help you do that. Mm. Um, so just becoming aware of sort of how your mind uh, will, will feed you certain things, and that sometimes those things will be helpful, and sometimes those things won't be too helpful. You know, so like if you've got a story which is like I am an honest person, chances are that's a functional story. That story will help you operate in the world well, mm. um, and, and will probably be consistent with who you want to be in the world. But some stories that we have, they're just they're, they're not they're not so good in helping us make decisions that are in line with the things that we want to do. So if you have a and you know, I'm not smart enough story. Maybe you don't try and do that master's course. Maybe you don't try and go for, go for that uh, promotion. Hmm. But becoming aware of that story, stepping away from it, and just looking at it, and not necessarily acting on its behalf. In, in other words, sort of still moving towards the things that are hmm. important you, to you, despite you know your your mind feeding you these stories. Um, that's probably. A more anxiety-provoking, but a, probably a more functional way of, of being in the world. Yeah, you're just making me think of a uh, a nice quote from the conference. One of the keynotes was Susan David, who wrote that book, Emotional Agility. Yeah. And she said something that's really stuck with me. She said, discomfort is the price of admission to a meaningful life. Yeah, it's brilliant. And and hell yeah, it's just so true. So, so thanks for that. I think that's a an amazing takeaway so i really appreciate that so nick it's time to say bye-bye um really really appreciate you coming on thank you so much i'm just praying that the tech has worked and i've actually got a recording at the end of this because i'll be gutted if i haven't oh, but, <laughs> i'm sure it'll be fine <laughs> and um yeah i'll let you know when i'm down in down your way and i'll make that appointment for some dancing well i'll i'll, I'll tell my son yeah Max, a man is coming here to dance with us <laughs> in our living room to uh, the wheels on the bus go round and round. Oh, that's that's the track. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll bear that in mind and and maybe work out some shapes for that. Okay, <laughs> Nick, thank you so much and look forward to, to catching up with you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Ross. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and uh, I look forward to hearing from some of those guests that you've got coming on in the future. Oh, cheers, man. Hey, P-Supers, that's it, in the bag. Season 2, Episode 1. Thanks again to Nick, and thanks to you for listening. Really keen to hear what you think. It's slightly longer than our usual format, but it was such an interesting interview, I didn't want to split it into two parts. You can get in touch via email at peoplesoup.pod at gmail.com, on Twitter at peoplesouppod, and on Instagram at people.soup. If you'd like to leave a review, that would be brilliant because it helps other people find the podcast, uh, particularly on iTunes. And you can leave a review and a star rating. So really, really grateful if you wouldn't mind doing that. Thanks to Andy Glenn. His spoons have progressed into season two. So thanks for that. Thanks once again to you for listening. I really appreciate it. Looking forward to recording the next episode this week. That should drop over next weekend. So take care, have a great week, and speak very soon. Oof. Right. Oof. How was that, man?
That was all right. I mean, that, that, like I said, I, I, in my mind, I still had the pints in front of me. I was just chatting to you. 